Uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Renard Fortier. He come to us from Canada, and obviously he is a welcome uh, addition to our forum here. Uh, we like to have international participation. He definitely fits the bill on that. Uh, uh, Dr. Fortier, obviously, um, uh, as a historian, uh, he's the uh, curator of the Canadian uh, Avi or Canada Aviation and Space Museum. He um, uh, has been with that museum since 1987, but he's been the curator of the museum since 1995. I must tell you that uh, his museum is located in Ottawa, Canada, and I uh, visit that museum uh, at least twice in my life, and I love that museum. It is a beautiful, well done, uh, a well uh, curated museum, and you, uh, Dr. Fortier, are definitely uh, uh, a reason uh, because you know a reason for that to be so. So we thank you for that uh, for that effort that you that you do when when you put the museum in in the in the proper place. Um, Dr. Fortier has obviously uh, written many papers. Uh, he's uh, he has done. Uh, papers on the history of Canadian aviation industry, uh, or the history of the aviation Canadian industry, and also uh, have uh, been interviewed in television and radio. And uh, but but I would like to give him the floor because there's a lot to talk about on this particular helicopter that he's going to be talking about the Intercity SC Mark VI helicopter, which to me is a very interesting item that we need to definitely explore. So without further ado. Dr. Fortier, please, you have the floor. Let me go, go ahead and go on mute, sir. Quick, very quickly, uh, Aviation Museum is part of a group of three museums, Science and Technology and Agriculture and Food. That's why you have the farm and the funny things on the picture there. Good morning. We're going to talk about helicopters, one of the great inventions of the 20th century. Uh, it took a while to develop helicopters, longer than it took to develop aircraft. The first one to actually lift under its own power, that's the Cornu helicopter in Paris. By the mid-1940s, helicopters were coming of age. Case in point, the Sikorsky machine here. It had taken a while to get them underway, but by then, a number of people and companies, because Second World War looking, number of manufacturers, or at least potential manufacturers, went from 10 or so to about 40 or so. Great interest in helicopters, great potential future after the war. Uh, you have companies, you also have individuals. Some of these individuals, of course, were not in the United States. There was, case in point, Mr. Pickin in on Hamilton, Ontario, who built this prototype, which never was never produced. But there was certainly a great deal of interest in helicopters pretty much all over the world. Well, at least the countries that had not been devastated by the war, France, Italy, Germany, Japan, etc. So the Soviet Union, United States, Canada, UK, there was definitely a lot of interest in helicopters. We are in 1943. There is hope of we're going to win the war. That's I'm talking as an American here. And we're going to win the war. There will be great things after the war. It will be great, and helicopters will be a part of that. And as you can see in the caption, Greyhound was interested in building, beside its bus network, a helicopter network of sort that would not replace, but supplement. The helicopter. So there were definitely a great deal of interest, and the image at the bottom of the screen there tells you some of the exuberance about helicopters. I mean, they, they were going to be the idea of the helicopter in every garage, for example. That sort of was of that period. Second World War, early post war years, but definitely it began during the Second World War. US, Canada were not the only places that had an interest in helicopters. Case in point, in Australia, this artist sort of imagined downtown Melbourne in 1970, which is, I found really bizarre, but it, it's really that sort of fascination about aviation, and in particular, the helicopter, the flying machine that every family could have. In Canada, around that time, we're looking at a company called Compagnie de Transport Provincial, Provincial Transport Company, which was a bit the equivalent for the province of Quebec of Greyhound, the largest bus, intercity bus service. They too thought that the helicopter could be used not to replace, but to supplement its network of buses for faster transit if you were in a hurry. Now, the size of the helicopter had to be defined, of course. They weren't quite sure how big they would have to be. But there was certainly an interest there to create this network. 
perhaps the, the helicopter could become the sort of Ford Model T of the post-war age. It was, again, the brilliance, the fascination, the interest in this brand new machine, the helicopter. Now, there were definitely a great deal of interest within the company to contact city and town councils to see if they would be interested in sort of like helping because of course the company had bus terminals intercity bus terminals in a lot of towns and cities in southern quebec montreal sherbrooke quebec city all, all over the place but many of these facilities could be shall we say modified for use as helicopter terminals if the companies do, do, decided to pursue its project now, a subsidiary was formed as part of that dream of the helicopter network called Intercity Airlines, which very well describes what the plan was. It was going to be an intercity network. All those town councils had been approached. Many of them, like by 1944, 45, something like 30, 40 cities and towns had been contacted in Quebec and Ontario also, but the company was based in Quebec, so that was their main interest. When this thing was published, in a couple of newspapers, not necessarily big ones, as Noville Relier par Helicopter, are cities linked by helicopters. Um, this, I'm fairly sure, is not the Montreal bus terminal. I have a feeling it's something derived by an American publication. It's probably like an image that was published in an American magazine, because the helicopters look a lot like they the streamlined look, an area around it look, look something, looked like something that a um, designer called Norman Bell Geddes. Would design it may not be his stuff but again it, it's similar to that so you're looking at projects being submitted by the company the federal government we're at war we're not going to do anything civilian until the end of the war wait until the end of the war which led to not early 1945 was well, it more like late summer early fall 1945 uh, intercity hires a polish-born engineer who was then living in the United States. And that's one of the main characters of our story comes in. Bernard Gurney, or Snitz, Snitzer. Again, apologies for any Polish person in the audience or person of Polish extraction if I massacre the family name. So Bernard Snitzer was one of the engineers. Who is this gentleman? Well, he was born in, of course, he's the one on the right. Um, he was born in what was then the Russian Empire in September 1904 became an engineer, um, became involved in aircraft skis, and that's how he ended up in the United States in the fall of 1939, which explains why he wasn't in Poland when the country was invaded by the Germans in the fall of 1939. After working in skis, he, went, he became involved in aircraft manufacturing, for example, an early flying bomb, which was not produced, became involved in gliders, transport gliders, which were not produced, and then drifted into helicopter design. Uh, some of his work was done with the person on the left, Selma Gottlieb, born in 1920, much younger than Mr. Snisser, um, educated mathematics, and then started an engineering degree. When the, the two of them became befriended, I have no idea. Presumably Second World War, 42, 43, 44. 44, they formed a design team, these two, and a gentleman named Court, Douglas Courtney Watson, probably or quite possibly the first black aeronautical engineer. These three found this, found this little group, which didn't survive all that long until like 1944, 45. And it is at that point, after these two failed to interest, or at least failed to get a project in Mexico off the ground, failed to gain too much interest from the Soviet government. The we say, offer from Intercity Airlines in Montreal was a gift from heaven. Both of them moved to Montreal in order to develop this helicopter and to eventually, well, hopefully produce it. A company was founded to produce it, which sank like a stone. So someone else had to be for, found to produce this helicopter. This was Engineering Products of Canada, which was a subsidiary of Goodrich in the tire company. They were willing to do it, but of course they had no experience whatsoever in aircraft manufacturing and helicopter manufacturing. Well, no one had any experience in doing that anyway, but they were certainly like 
clueless as far as aircraft manufacturing is concerned. And let's not forget that Sneezer and Gottlieb were the only engineers on the team. So there were no like computers, they didn't have like 500 students or people doing stuff, they were it. And the few engineers at engineering products who didn't know much about aircraft manufacturing. Fall 1946, the SG-6C prototype is being built. It's being presented to members of the media, members of the local, well, municipal, Montreal, provincial, Quebec, and national Canada government, who are very interested and very impressed when a team sort of disassembles the aircraft and reassembles the aircraft in about 40 minutes to disassemble and 40 minutes to reassemble. Because they were very impressed by that. So, and that's one thing that the company was very interested in to publicize the aircraft, the helicopter, because it was thought that the helicopter had potential, possibly more in Canada than the US, because Canada by and large is a big wilderness. In the States, you have lots of wilderness, but at least you have cities around the wilderness. In our case, we have wilderness that goes all the way to the North Pole and all the way to Russia. So a helicopter, or helicopters plural, could be very important here. First flight of the SG-6C was in July 1947 at Montreal Dorval Airport, which is now Montreal Pierre Trudeau International Airport. Pilot was American, was Mr. Henry J. Eagle Jr. And you can see him there with the various signature, Selma Gottlieb and various signatures on there on the photo. Very basic helicopter, but there was no need to have anything fancy. Uh, the C was more or less a proof of concept prototype. The structure was a tad iffy. Again, the engineers and the workers had no experience of building aircraft, so they did, they did the best they could. But the potential was certainly there. It had promise. There was interest when the aircraft flew. Companies, apparently a few countries, sort of went and kicked the tires and see if there would be. So the team could be very proud, and of course, very small team. We have the two of them there. Sneezer and Gottlieb, the pilot, the center, engine, again, it's a skeleton. As I said, somewhat iffy, iffy structure, so the, D, the C was not going to be the production version. So an improved model, the SG-6D, the Grey Gull, was built. Test flown, February 1948, and you have around, probably around the time of the first flight, just before or just after, uh, Montreal in winter is not Miami Beach. It's bloody cold and bloody miserable. At least it can be. It can be delightful, but at the end it can be like miserable weather. Not being an engineer, and I won't say too much because I could get wrong, but by and large, you're looking at two road, well, a four blade rotor, two blades, two, a pair of two blade rotors superposed, you might say. Uh, Schneeser and Gottlieb had done everything they could to sort of minimize vibration, metal fatigue, which could be a problem with helicopter. So you had shock dampers, governor controlled engine, the whole kit and caboodle. Safety devices also were included to reduce the risk of accidents and to, risk, to reduce the risk of injury if you happen to have an accident. Again, not being an engineer, you're looking at 1946, static testing, and look at the water in the glass. Again, not an engineer, but to me, that looks pretty good. So they certainly had succeeded in minimizing the vibrations to a great extent. Now, even though it had been designed for use in Canada, the Grey Gull could operate in temperatures as high as 95 degrees of high levels of humidity. The idea being, and that's always been the case for the aircraft industry in Canada, the local market is too small. If you want to actually make money making aircraft, you have to export. Uh, you're looking at the Avalon aircraft, you're looking at Bell helicopters, I mean, you're looking at any company that makes aircraft in Canada, you have to export. So that was why it was designed to actually operate in places like, for example, Florida or South America. Pretty much all the elements had been manufactured in Canada, or some of them in the US, engine, for example. The idea was that it could be mass produced, and that's why it had been designed. Let me rewind here. The helicopter had been designed in such a way that it could be mass produced using equipment or methods of the automobile industry. One could even imagine a number of companies scattered all across Canada or the US making parts for this thing, sending them to the central location, which would assemble them, a bit like you would assemble a car. Solid, reliable, 
it worked. But at the time, looking late 40s, 48, 49, uh, the helicopter industry was going through tough times. A number of small manufacturing companies had been set up to manufacture helicopters, like Landgraf, for example, which made one or two helicopters and sort of went belly up. But there were also some small established companies which tried to, not aviation related, which tried to build helicopters, again, because it was thought around 1943, 44, 45, that there was a big future for helicopter. Companies that would not be known as aircraft manufacturing firms, like aeronautical products, maybe, but uh, American Dying Tool, not so much. So these helicopters were built, prototype, formed, tested, and that was that. So the 30, 40 aircraft, sorry, helicopter manufacturing firms that were formed between, let's say, 1944 and 1950, many of them, if not most of them, had either abandoned the idea and went back to what they were doing, either like tool and die or else aircraft, or else they had simply gone belly up. Through that time, Caesar kept the fate as best he could. Um, for example, he worked on an agricultural version of the SG-6. He was also working on a twin-engine tandem rotor helicopter, 12 feet, which might have been used by, by intercity airlines to actually do the transport of passengers, because the SG-6 is a two, three or four passenger vehicle. A taxi, maybe, but not all that much. Incidentally, Mr. Schnitzer obtained his American citizenship in December 49, so he seemingly didn't plan to remain in Canada any longer than he had to. Late 1950, of course, the helicopter is flying, it's been flying for a while, even though there had been like difficult times for the company, like for about 18 months in 1948-49, the intercity, because of the problems with the helicopter industry or and the, the limited use of helicopters in 48-49 in the United States, Intercity, they will stop working on the SG-6, which basically drove Mr. Schnitzer and Ms. Gottlieb completely bonkers. They also had fired people, rehired a few of them without too much explanations, which again drove Mr. Schnitzer to distraction. I mean, he was not a happy camper at that time. So by late 1950, the necessity to certify the aircraft if you wanted to carry passengers and turn it into a commercial project. Jack Charlson, inspector, Canada's Department of Transport arrives in Montreal. Let's certify this thing in January, February. So over a period of six days, again, Montreal is not Miami Beach. You're looking at rain, you're looking at snow, you're looking at freezing rain, calm breezes, brutal winds, warm-ups, freezes. Six days, the certification process went on with the American pilot who was the company pilot, and Mr. Charleston, who was also a helicopter pilot. They tortured the poor thing. But thanks to the, uh, let's see, the technical team, it worked. April 1951, the SG-6, the Grey Gull, became the first helicopter designed within the Commonwealth to receive its certification. According to Mr. Sneeser, no helicopter had ever gone through a certification process in that kind of weather. And when he's mentioned the kind of weather to some of his friends in the U.S. on phone conversation, they thought he was joking. He was not. It was appalling. Completely appalling. And something that should be noted, um, Intercity did not receive any government assistance, either civilian or military. It was all done by private money. I really like those two pictures. Next one, how about the, the one that you'll see now? So you can have fun, still be engineers. Yeah, of course, people from American Helicopter like the photo so much that they use it for the cover. By that time, of course, looking spring of 1951, again, no offense to American in the audience, uh, nasty Americans had pretty much taken over the world market for helicopter. Companies like Sikorsky or Bell. So. Intercity, Schnitzer, Gottlieb, uh, what were they supposed to do with that? When the, the armed forces of Canada were buying American helicopters. First RCF helicopter, Royal Canadian Air Force, was buying a Sikorsky S-51. 
And if I'm not mistaken, that's the first one. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the one we have at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum, the best aviation museum in Canada. Uh, the other one in the other picture, the bottom of transport, their first helicopter was an S-51. Definitely a big problem there of finding markets for this new machine, which worked, except that Sikorsky and Bell had facilities that were running, they were producing these things compared to Canada, which surely could use helicopters because there was recognition. Everyone agreed that given the absence of road in northern countries, in the northern Canada, if you want to go and develop mining, it would be useful to have helicopters because there are no roads. The rivers are frozen six months of the year. So unless you want to use a canoe in summertime and a dog team in winter or build runways all over the place, helicopters can go in places where aircraft can't go small ones and bigger ones. So there was definitely a potential there for Canada to become a leader in the helicopter industry. But as far as intercity as SG6 were concerned, time had run out. The firm withdrew its support during the winter of 54, sorry, 53, 54, after sinking something like 300 grants. By then, Mr. Schnitzer and Ms. Gottlieb had probably left Canada. 1953, a new company, Can American Helicopter Manufacturing Company Limited, it's a very long name, bought the rights and tried to relaunch helicopter. Didn't work. American representative of Can American, which was SNS Machinery of Brooklyn, expressed an interest, took, legally of course, the Grey Gull to the United States. Its projects went sideways. So the Grey Gull ended up being stored and stayed there for 45 years until around 2000. It became, a, sorry, it became available. We were informed that it was available, great interest. Unfortunately, around the same time, we were also informed that an airplane called the Baral Maran, which was, as far as we know, the oldest airplane, sorry, oldest airplane known to have flown in Canada, 100 year old, well, at the time it was nine years old, 1910, was also available. So decision, decision, do we go for the SG-6 or do we go for the Borel Maran? Eventually the decision was made and it was a perfectly good decision. We went for the Borel Maran, which is on the floor of our museum. So we have the oldest surviving airplane known to have flown in Canada. The SG-6 was acquired, which is very good, by the Reynolds Alberta Museum, great institution. Anything from snow plows to plows to automobiles to airplanes and helicopters, and they have the Grey Gull, which is on display. Now, after the collapse of the intercity project, as I said, Mr. Witzer returned to the United States, did not abandon helicopter. Now, we have him here on the left with Mr. Whoops, okay, on the left here, um, on the right is. Mr. Agar was Mr. Helicopter. He was one of the big guys as far as helicopter use, civilian in Canada, with a company called Okanagan Helicopters. And I presume some people in the room or people in the audience would know the company. At the time, eventually became one of the largest, possibly the largest civil helicopter operator on the planet. They helped, especially Mr. Agar helped Mr. Schnitzer to develop what was the first, as far as I know, flying crane to be actually built and tested, and we have one there, the BS-12 or SB-12. It, it worked fine. I mean, the, the helicopter had no problem. It was reliable. It was successful. It, has, it had a capability of lifting the containers, a bit like a helicopter that Sikorsky built later. Unfortunately, for a variety of reason, it couldn't sell in a small company trying to introduce a new product when you have giant companies like Bell and Sikorsky, which had pretty much cornered the market, it didn't work. So the small American company, Omega, went out of business after manufacturing only three BS-12s. Uh, further versions of the helicopter were proposed, but were never built. The flying crane concept, of course, did not fall out the window, you have the Sikorsky Sky Crane. So we have there a model of the SB-12 with the pilot, test pilot of the SB-12 or BS-12. I don't like the BS expression too much. Um, Mr. Schnitzer, Schnitzer and his wife. 
What did he do after the collapse of the Omega helicopter project? Well, he pretty much abandoned aeronautical engineering. One can understand why that not been a very encouraging or very it was a satisfying experience. His wife encouraged him, who was a ballerina, former ballerina and teacher, Catherine Sagava Sneeser, encouraged him to do like write, paint, sculpt, keep your mind occupied. So the two of them worked on translations of plays. He directed plays, he painted. He certainly was very happy, busy on that score. Until November 1970, uh, LaGuardia Airport, New York City, he died of a heart attack at the airport. He was only 66 years old, it's a damn shame. Uh, Ms. Gottlieb, in turn, sort of dropped out of aeronautical work, took a research internship, internship at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Oceanographic Institution, sorry. Uh, eventually later, enrolled at University of Pennsylvania in medicine. But having married in 1954, I mean, the oceanographic career and the medical career sort of were put aside. The couple had three children. They were quite happy. Um, she was involved in local politics. She was a keen bridge player, apparently, with a life master certificate from the American Contract Bridge League. Volunteer work, she typed books in Braille for the Philadelphia Association for the Blind. Eventually, she left this world in March 2011, at the ripe old age of 90. So this is, in a nutshell, very, very quickly, if you have the rush job, the history of the SG-6 C and D, the Grey Gall, by these two individuals, remarkable individuals, for a number of reasons, the project didn't work. I mean, it, it worked technically, it didn't work commercially. One could say the same thing of Concorde, actually, but that's not a story. So unique characters, remarkable story, history of aviation in Canada. Very often, aviation in Canada was developed by Canadians, for Canadians. In some cases, we had people coming from outside to develop aircraft. Some of them stayed, some of them left. Snitzer and Gottlieb left, unfortunate, but they went on to very successful, productive, and happy life. And as we well know, as we all know, Bell helicopters, Sikorsky, are still very much with us. That's pretty much how I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Fortier. What a fascinating story and the characters involved in that story. Uh, just like the German uh, story earlier, uh, to make you know, a lot of characters to go and do research, historical research, because to be honest, we know very little about those folks. Um, their names are up there, but I bet you that you had a hard time trying to piece all you know their histories and backgrounds together. It's not a, it's not an easy thing to do, and I, we do appreciate your efforts in that regard.